Hello everyone, um, welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Day Tutu and today I have another guest who is going to talk about an interesting topic. He's, um, he's completed his PhD here in Germany in AI governance and he's going to take us through his experience studying AI. We all know that AI is a new thing um, that everyone is talking about now. So I'm really fascinated to know more about his PhD experience and what he has to tell us about completing a PhD and also the future of AI. Um, his name is Gabriel, but I'm going to give him the opportunity to introduce himself. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Thank you so much, Data. To um, my name is Gabriel Udo. I am from Nigeria, but I live here in Germany, lived here for about five years now. Um, I'm currently uh, a visiting scholar at the University of Hamburg and. Uh, she, that's to say that I completed my PhD. It's just a submission. I've not defended it. So well, many people come. Many people the, come end the end is near. The end is near. The end is near. Exactly. So I'm a PhD candidate at uh, the European University of Viadrino in Frankfurt Order. Uh, and it's, I've been there for the last three years and uh, two, three months. Yeah. So that's uh, the basic information about me. Maybe subsequently we'll get to talk more about my research. Okay. So, Thank you for that. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah. You're welcome. Nice to have you here. Um, so to my next question, can you um, enlighten us on what influenced your decision to pursue a PhD in AI governance, one, and also why Germany? Because you could have also considered, for example, United States or United Kingdom. So um, I'll just uh, break it down the way you've asked the question. First, what, uh, what pushed me to do a PhD. Um, I've always loved research. PhD is mostly about research, especially in, <clears throat> in the social sciences. Though my own, my PhD, my thesis, my um, research was mostly interdisciplinary. So there were very scientific aspects and there were aspects that, are, that were just um, social science related mostly. Uh, so to, uh, I have had, already had a master's degree, so I, I thought I had enough um, of such experience. But I needed to go do more research into certain areas, and so I needed to do a PhD. Secondly, I've loved academia, wanted to be in the academia. I like to teach, and of course, it's always required. The, most universities now have a minimum requirement of a PhD. There are few instances where um, a very good master's degree would also do the job. Uh, then in Germany, I'll start with why I, I chose to do it in Germany, because that's the, the shorter answer. And then why I choose to do it in, in the area related to AI. Uh, I think Germany has a, a very, um, you know, how do I put this, a, a very good environment for carrying out academic studies generally. First of all, you're not paying fees, so the, the, it's tuition free. Mm -hmm. Now, if you compare this to um, other countries like the US or the UK that you mentioned, doing, doing a PhD is either they're doing it with a, on a scholarship or you're paying a lot of money. I've heard people that have had to pay student loans for so many years after their studies. And that's the one thing I always wanted to afford. I tried, I applied for uh, PhDs or even master's degrees in other countries before. And I applied, I got admissions in Canada. But of course, the offer letter would always come with the fee. And then I realized that that wasn't going to work. So Germany, first of all, was a, a very a viable option because of the financial implications. Mm -hmm. That given the fact that you're not going to pay tuition. And then uh, Germany, especially for the area of artificial intelligence and many other areas in science, um, Germany is one of the top countries in the world. You yeah. want to learn from the actual professionals. You know, there's this myth that people say, oh, Europe, some parts of Europe is really good with science. It's not, now it's not just a myth because I've spoken with professionals here mm -hmm. and you know that um, they are. Uh, you are really deep into this. You also have access to um, funding, apart okay. from the fact that your academics is um, almost completely free. Yep. You know, your study is almost completely free. You have lots of access. There are lots of opportunities to get your studies funded here. So um, I looked at all this and I thought, okay, Germany is, is a good place. This, this, the, prob the language problem, people think it's a problem. I don't think so. But many people would say, oh, there's a language problem. I don't want to. But I think that for me, I think that's an advantage. It right? is, definitely. And to speak to that, 
a large percentage of courses in Germany, including PhDs like mine, are in English. Mm -hmm. So you have the academic environment most times is in English. So it gives you the opportunity while doing your studies to also learn the language, even if you don't intend to use it. German is a widely used language. Many countries around Austria, yeah. Switzerland, they use the language too. So this, this is why I choose Germany. And um, why I went into, um, why I decided to get into an area in artificial intelligence. You know, it just reminds me of uh, about 2022, two years ago, I went to Nigeria um, for, to present a paper. I made the mm -hmm. presentation where a couple of lawyers sitting together and I told them that a time is coming. Most of the things you do or you think you can do will, will be done by uh, some kind of artificial intelligence. And that mm -hmm. was October 2022, I remember. And they all just laughed, you know, it felt like. And so immediately after that, I came back to Germany. Some of them asked me, what makes you think? So I'm not sure what you're seeing in Germany that makes you think life is going to change. You know, they just kept playing around with the idea and then mm -hmm. they shut it down. But the following year, the following year, just uh, three, three weeks later, charge it 3.5 cameras. <laughs> and boom, yeah. everyone was wrong. They now thought, Okay, now this is serious. So I started having calls. I started having WhatsApp chats. Um, Gabriel, you need to come back with this. There are, there are questions we need to ask because now they started seeing that, okay, we're getting there. So why did I bring this up? I had always known. I used to design softwares before I studied law. Okay. Um, I, I had the impression at some point. I was way younger. I think I was 16, 17 then. And that was many years ago. Not now that we have laptops all over. Yes. That was when you have, there's one computer on the old street. Mm -hmm. So that, that I had that idea early enough that at some point, most of the things we are doing now by hand, people would find a way to computerize everything. So mm -hmm. I didn't really have the idea of AI, but I knew that people are looking for easier ways to do things. People are trying to simplify their lives. And one of the easiest, one of the ways to simplify your life is going to be technology, some kind of technology. Mm -hmm. The size of computers were reduced. Mobile phones were changed from the long landlines to mobile phones. Everything was changing very quickly. So I, I suspected. And I started building, even though I went to study law, I kept law and technology side by side. Now, when I had my master's in international, I realized that uh, there's a lot. Technology is going to blow up so many things. It's going to affect society, change the way laws are made and regulations are made. Uh, so I decided to go into AI. Mm -hmm. so you know, as a basic aspect. And um, I, I, I started realizing that the improvements were happening at the back until we had this blow up some years ago. Mm -hmm. so it's time, there's an opportunity to prepare myself for the future because artificial intelligence is more like the future, whether we agree now or we are going to agree later. Mm -hmm. But um, it, so I, I thought this was the opportunity for me <clears throat> to do with that career. I had a little tech background at the time started doing some courses in AI online and then started my PhD there. And uh, it really, really did help me. So this is in a nutshell why um, I choose I made those choices. Thank you for the background and everything. Can you please um, also explain the application process as someone who has um, applied for programs in other countries? What was the application process for your PhD um, in Germany? Yeah, the, the application process uh, for PhDs depends on a lot of things. First of all, it depends on your location at the time of the application. Now, I'm going to explain that. Then it also depends on um, the type of PhD. There are, there are two basic, two major types of PhDs in Germany. If, if, if you're, I mean, there are people who do their PhDs from institutions, right? They work in a company and then are supervised by a professor in a faculty. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, then in, in the academic environment, we have the structured and the unstructured um, tracks. So the structured tracks, uh, the faculty determines almost everything. You know, um, the, the process of application, which means you have to submit some documentation. You have to write maybe an abstract of um, what research you intend to carry out. Mm -hmm. But then in, that, in the structured, in the structured um, track, the faculty determines you know, what area is your PhD going to be in? And then um, they tell you what documentation to submit and they give you feedback, how long is it going to take? So all that's dependent, dependent mostly on the faculty and the university. 
But I took the unstructured track, which um, most people had mentioned that it's way more complicated. But for me, it wasn't that complicated. Uh, if you enjoy research, then you would like that. That the unstructured part means that you're not going to do coursework. You're basically just getting a professor to supervise your research, get an affiliation with the university faculty, and then do your research yourself. So it requires a lot of independence. So in, with this, the process like I did was, first of all, you're going to write um, not just an, an abstract, but you're going to talk a lot more about your research, whatever you choose to call it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's more like informing people that this is the area you want to research in. What makes it more complicated is that when you write your, um, when you write uh, your abstract and send it to uh, a professor, there's a likelihood that the professor might say, sorry, I'm not, my skills are not in this area, or I don't know. So it leaves you very limited options because you have to, in this case, you're looking for a professor, which I will get to. Mm -hmm. So you think about a research idea, write um, your, your abstract, or in my case, I wrote a whole research proposal, right? Your research proposal breaks down what you intend to do in your thesis. You even have more like a timetable because you have to inform the professor, let the professor know how many years am I giving for these guys or this person's research. Mm -hmm. So you do that and you do a research timetable. This is what I'll do for the month one to this month and this month or this year and this year. Because there's no structure. So you have to create a structure for yourself. Mm -hmm. Then you attach this and look for professors in that field. Right. You could go on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is very is a very important resource, mm -hmm. which is something that we could spend another two hours talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're going to find professors in that field. Reach out to them and don't just write to them saying, Can I speak with you? In Germany, especially, they will not answer you. And I don't blame them. Right? <laughs> because, yeah, because life life is so busy. You when you're writing to them, explain you want to do a PhD in this area, please find attached these. You know, the research proposal and then my research timetable. I'll be glad to talk about this more if you have the chance. Many times they will say, sorry, I'm not, I don't have the time. But you're going to find some that will say, hmm, yeah, I like your proposal, but how about you adjust this like How about you do this like that? That happened in my case. I just said, okay, let's have a call. And we had a phone call. Um, we talked about it and said, yeah, I really like the proposal. But make this adjustment. Don't talk about it this way. Um, talk about it this way, which still made sense to me. It fell within the framework of what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Just to restructure it. When you get this, then the the professor will tell you the university where he's affiliated to. That's if you didn't really find that. Then you write to the faculty, telling them that you've spoken with this professor, and the professor has agreed to defend on this topic. One or the professor would give you a document, a detailed document he signed. Mm -hmm. You know, like. Um, saying that he has agreed to supervise you on this topic. Then you, you attach, you send that document to the faculty. Then the faculty will inform you of what other things to submit. Let's say, let's assume you have a master's degree. You want to see that, you want to see your master's thesis, or those things that are required as to qualify you to do a PhD. When you have that, then the faculty will issue um, a PhD contract. You will sign, the dean of the faculty signs, your supervisor signs. So, once these three signatures are there, you're a, P, you're, you're a PhD. Your supervisor will tell you, okay, go ahead with your research. Then whatever else happens will be determined between you and your supervisor. You only go back to the faculty mm -hmm. when you're done. And you tell them, okay, now it's time to defend. So this is hmm. uh, not so. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Sounds complicated, right? Yeah, yes. It does, it does sound complicated. At least for this unstructured one, yeah? Mm -hmm. It does sound complicated. The structured one seems more straightforward, like, you know, quite similar to applying for, <clears throat> excuse me, a master's degree that they just give you the, the information they need, you, you submit, and they let you know yeah. if they're offering you a position or not. Okay. Yeah. The, 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 the advantage for me of a stru on a structured PhD, especially in Germany, is if you do research like I do, you're... you're there's what I call the wild researcher, right? You you find many ideas in one box. A structured PhD keeps you keep your head on this. But okay. um, a structured PhD, you can find something. You can go and do a fellowship 
I've done fellowships in other areas, like gotten deep in. I got to a point in my research, I said, no, I need to know more about how AI functions. Mm -hmm. So I went back to study Python, right? Okay. Yeah. And that's that's something I could do because I had the time, I had the opportunity, I knew what I needed, I had to define. I just needed to have a deeper understanding because I was now going to for conferences to present my PhD. You're not just going to go as a social scientist. You're talking with people who have done physics for 30 years, mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm. or people who design software. And you're just telling them, well, the law says this. It, it's going to be too sharp. Like, yeah. it, happened to me, it happened to me in a conference. I went to me, and some tech guys were like, hey, do you know how this thing really works? You need to look at the back, you know, before you have this kind of discussion of how this system works. Mm -hmm. You need to look at the what happens at the other end of the technology. So you need to know how these softwares are built, what uh, algorithms look like behind what you see in front of you. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, so in an unstructured PhD, you can do that. In a structured PhD, while you can do that, you know you have a time limit. You know, you know you have restrictions, you have coursework to do. Sometimes you have you are a teaching assistant or a research assistant. In the mm -hmm. So you have school work to do. You cannot really do tech another full-time job if it's yeah. going to translate the requirements of the Right. But in the case of an unstructured PhD, it doesn't matter. You could take a full-time job, do whatever you want. But when it's time, you have to submit your thesis or you have to stay in touch with your office. So that's what I, I think. Okay. Wow. Okay. So aside from having an interest in research um, and having like a strong interest in academia, being able to actually pull your thoughts together and make it meaningful? What are the other skills you need to develop or have to pursue a PhD? Okay. Um, well, there are a thousand and one skills you need to have to pursue. <laughs> there, there are many, so I can't talk about all of them, but I'll talk about, for example, you need to have a couple. couple of Just tell us a couple. <laughs> yeah. You need to have, there are hard skills, there are soft skills. You need to have a lot of resilience. PhDs, whether structured or unstructured, when you see people that have PhDs, Till today, I still I understand that um, it's not just you know you can work, you can research, or you. It needs a lot of mental resilience. I've seen people who start their PhDs and leave in the mm -hmm. third year. I don't blame them. It's like a, we used to say it's like a, a madhouse. You don't know what to expect. You are you are you are um, you're exposed to a lot of things. For instance, your your supervisor's emotions. Could change a lot. You could, your supervisor will work over morning and say, I don't know what you've written for the last two years. And you start feeling like, oh no, so I've been terrible. Why, why he is he or she like this today? Mm -hmm. So you need a lot of resilience. That's just you know one of the soft skills. But basically, you need to have um in the case of artificial intelligence and things related to artificial intelligence, whether in the social sciences or in, in core sciences, you need to have some technical skills. Like I mentioned, I had to go and study, you know, you need to know how the algorithm is. Whatever you're going to study, ethics, governance. Many people think it's not necessary if you're in, if you're in governance you to know how the algorithm is. But I don't think that's true. You're not going to have an, um, an idea of how um, a system works without knowing what's happening at the background, especially in the case of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, then for a PhD, generally, you need to have writing skills. It, it, it research research is mostly about writing. Uh, sometimes, many times, you're required to do presentations, conferences. But a large percentage of your PhD research is going to require writing skills. Not now that ChatGPT people use uh, large language models or to write a lot of things. But you need to have your own writing skills. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to have an analytical thinking um, mm -hmm. you know, at a very high level. You need that skill, especially. Because um, critical thinking, especially, is an aspect of research. You for PhDs, it's not in master's degrees, for instance. You can just pick up someone's idea and say, "I agree with this guy," or "I don't agree with this guy." Yeah. But PhDs require that you have a new idea. It's not just enough to say, "Yeah, Mr. A said this. I agree with it." You you need to be able to critically think through ideas. Mm -hmm. How do you solve the problems? How do you analyze issues? So you need critical thinking skills. Um, you need to understand research and methodology, which is something that's very, again, very important. You need to be skilled at doing research. How do I gather information? How do I do quantitative or qualitative uh, research? 
uh, how do I review literature? And uh, in the case of AI governance also, you need to understand um, have general legal knowledge. How do I analyze policies? How do I look at regulations? How do I look at laws differently? from um, How people generally, because that's what makes you different. Mm -hmm. how, do I, how do I get, uh, you know, deeper ideas from just looking at laws that are written? Because it's how you reinterpret governance and uh, sorry policies that makes your your skill uh, different. Uh, you need to also have skills like collaboration skills, the ability to work together with other people. You're going to work in research groups at some point. Some people don't like it. They, they prefer to just do their thing and don't bet. The, one of the things you get to do during your PhD, whether it's structured or unstructured, is to get into fellowships, um, build your experience by speaking with people. So you also need communication skills. Project management skills is also important. Uh, you, you, it's a PhD is a project. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's a full time project. You're going to have time thinking about it. Otherwise, you'll have very, very little problems like time management. You want to write your chapter one and chapter two in the next six months. And the next six months, you remember that there's a business you didn't conclude. You dump this. And by the time you come back, oh God, then everything bombs on you. You start getting over stress. So you need to have skills like that. Then um, the ability to adapt, mm -hmm. like I talked about, into different situations, continual learning. Uh, if something new comes up, which happened to me in my, my PhD, in my own research, something new can come up in the middle and your chapter two, three, and four has to change completely because of just mm -hmm. something like yeah. So you need to be able to adapt very quickly and to turn around a lot of things in a short time. Like I said, there are, there are many other skills you need. Mm -hmm. These are like the basic things that you need to have in your pocket before you decide to get <laughs> Okay. Okay, nice. Is it, um, are you allowed to talk about your PhD summary, your, your PhD research now? Or... Yeah, definitely. Okay. okay. I talked, can you... I talked about it two days ago. So okay. <laughs> can you give us a summary of what your research topic is about like okay. two minutes. yeah so basically um my generally my research areas are in artificial intelligence governance policy law we look at the imp i look at the impact of artificial intelligence in society mm -hmm. and how we can make laws and policies to fix them right to make sure that yeah we have technologies we develop them but we have to make sure that it's not really affecting people negatively it will mm -hmm. happen but we can have legislations to reduce them. My th in my thesis, which is usually something very, you know, I looked at the um, the legal and ethical implications of uh, artificial intelligence in weapon systems and lethal weapon systems. Right? Um, again, usually when I mention that, everyone is like, "What are you doing with weapon systems?" Uh, I I realized that everyone talks about what AI is doing to society and there are some areas that are more important that are completely left. Mm -hmm. So my PhD generally looked at that area, the introduction of autonomy and artificial intelligence into weapon systems um, is something that is capable or that is already changing society, it's changing how armed conflicts are, are being fought or even at peace times. There are technologies that are changing um, the number of people that die during warfare. Mm -hmm. So my thesis looks at what are the implications on that law? What laws protect people and societies? Or in international international humanitarian law, do we have laws of war that actually accommodate the use of artificial intelligence in weapon systems? What are the legal, the ethical implications? Uh, how can we use, if we insist on using AI in legal in uh, weapon systems, how can we use them ethically in such a way that war remains war, but it's also fought with some understanding of ethics. Outside that, even outside armed conflict, how do we use um, artificial intelligence, for instance, in policing, in, in policing in societies? How do we ensure that these weapon systems are used within the boundaries of law and ethics? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is like a very two-minute summary of you know, very Yeah, but I have a question. Um, yeah. Are there countries that have adopted um, AI, like maybe a, a, a restriction on AI governance, on AI use for um, weapons. Weapon systems. Yeah. Um, well, in first of all, at the international realm, mm -hmm. then for the last uh, ten years or eleven years now, there's a, a group on there's a, a group of governmental experts. It's under the United Nations. Uh, the group of governmental experts on 
the ONDA, the, they have conversations around the convention on, not on conventional weapons. Right? It's a very funny name, they're called in the CCW. Right? Okay. So it's a, a group of specialists that have had this discussion. On, it's still under the UN, but they were moved aside in 2016. They've been sitting unofficially till 2016, and then they, you know, they, um, they were recreated into an official group um, to discuss these issues and come up with uh, regulations or suggestions as to what would serve as regulation. Now, this group has sat for till now, up till two months ago, and so far. Now, in this group, you have governments, experts, specialists, all uh, submitting um, what they think, you know, their ideas about the use of autonomy weapons. So officially, so far, there is no country that has really banned the use of artificial intelligence weapons because, honestly speaking, it's still a very, it's not new. It's been there for almost 100 years. People have started using um, autonomy in weapon systems. Mm -hmm. But I think it's now that people are really waking up to the idea that, oh, this could really, this could really be dangerous. Mm -hmm. So there's no country so far that has been able to sit down and say, okay, let's, let's do this. Some years ago, three, four years ago, I think South Africa just mentioned it. You know, they talked about it. When you look at the submissions at the UN or at the, uh, this uh, Committee on Conventional Weapons, you hear every state says, we don't want this, or let's regulate it, let's ensure that. But um, there's no you know, internal policy in states now that have been found it. Already have, many states have said, yeah, let's do something about it. Let's find a way to get some ethical uh, guardrails around it or legal uh, or regulations around it. But there is no, so far, no state that has come out to say, no, we, we can't allow it. Okay. So, okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you for answering my question. I was just curious. <laughs> Okay. Um, and to my final question, um, what do you think is the future of um, AI and how can we harness it to our advantage without solely depending on it? Because you see a lot of conversations now, especially on the internet, where people are like, people are doing their research solely with ChatGPT or whatever other AI application. People are creating content with AI. People are creating videos with AI, right? There is that lack of um, originality now, right? Yeah. So um, what do you think is the future? How can we make sure that, okay, we are using it to advantage, yes, but that's not the only thing we are doing to kind of avoid losing ourselves or losing the ability to think or come up with new ideas and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, um, well, first of all, as, like I'd always say, AI is actually the future. So <laughs> whether we're prepared for it or not, most <laughs> people are not really prepared for AI. We talk about it a lot, but we're not, we, we, we're not prepared for it. I've, I've spoken to a couple of universities in Nigeria and said, look, we need to look at our, our course outlines again. It's time we're not running. We're still running in the 1970s, especially mm -hmm. down in the global south. We need to begin to think towards the future. What, uh, I've read students' thesis because I supervise the profile, and I've seen someone write a thesis with almost 90% of it from, from you know, it's AI generated. And I knew the student did not know that I would know because the student was in a country that ChatGPT was not very popular. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so when he wrote and sent it, sent it to me, I called him and I told him, I just looked at it and I, because I mean, uh, in my research, I've seen I've worked with large language models. Mm -hmm. I know how they work. Mm -hmm. So I told I told the student, look, you have to rewrite this, or I'll send this to the faculty. And they no, no, no. I told him I'm not asking you. I'm telling you that this is not you. Eventually, the student admitted, and you know we got that sorted. But first of all, um, AI will come with a lot of positive and negative things. We would, a society would do so well if we could harness those positive impacts. But the society would fail woefully if we fail to cope the negative impact. Mm -hmm. We we are going to have, for instance, the positive impact with this this speed in everything people do, writing uh, content creation, which is for me creating content with AI is not really a bad idea, but it has to be done ethically. Mm -hmm. you know, if I if I 
create, maybe I, I've made a picture out of ChatGPT. Um, first of all, I need to inform people that this picture was AI generated. Yeah. Because I saw a new picture that. on Instagram now that, that says that you, you need to actually click on a button to say that this content is AI generated, kind of. Yeah. yeah. I think I saw that last yeah. week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Many social media platforms are already doing that. I worked on a, a I did, well, I did, I conducted a project for Mozilla. It's, mm -hmm. it's online. Okay. It's public, the, the reports have been published on why I suggested we should watermark AI generated content. You know, there has to be a watermark. So we made suggestions to um, companies that build large language models mm -hmm. to watermark, you know, to have this embedded in their software so that when AI generates a content, there's an original, there's a watermark with the content. So anybody mm -hmm. seeing it would know that this is not, uh, you know, um, human made. Now, because we're going to have problems, especially with elections and people coming up with, yeah, this voice clip was made by this person. You could see that in Nigeria already last year, mm -hmm. two years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, we need to check out those, for those negative impacts and solve them. We're going to have problems. People are going to lose their jobs. This is something people take, take lightly, but it's not. I've seen research that says, yeah, you just upskill and deskill, but uh, you just upskill or learn something new. You, that, there's a, there's a limit to which you can upskill. You need to understand the legal implication, or sorry, the, the financial implications of somebody upskilling, learning mm -hmm. new skills. Or let's say somebody that is already retiring, 60 years old, I've been doing this for the last 40 years, and you tell him to go and upskill to so where? So first, people are going to lose their jobs. Secondly, there's uh, what we call de-skilling. It happens to all of us every day. We don't notice it. De-skilling simply means that you, you begin to lose your skills, your capacities, because there's a technology doing it for you. Mm -hmm. right. A simple example is if you've been writing by hand a lot and then you start typing, after four or five years, the next time you start writing, you'll be slower. If you, you can live in cities like Lagos and know everywhere, but when you come to Germany, that it should be easier to find places because there's Google Maps. Every time you want to go, they said it's, it's just straight ahead, you still open your Google Maps. So it mm -hmm. reduces your capacity. It's something that is happening in universities, it's a lot. Students just know they can write this thing with ChatGPT, so they don't bother to just write it. After one year, two years, you tell them to write um, a one-page application letter. And they don't remember how to do it. This is happening at a, at a terrific speed. Mm -hmm. And that's because people are just giving in to AI without looking at the negative implications, how to sustain society and to make sure that we don't lose everything. So there are, there are many, many other negative impacts of, um, that we can look at just so many of them. But finally, if as much as society is not prepared, if or any society that is not prepared, and I'm saying this especially with regards to societies in the global south, because uh, here in Europe, there's a, there's a lot of preparation made. You hear regulations like the Artificial Intelligence Act, you go to US, you hear all these regulations in California and all that. You go to UK, you go even to China, Japan. So everybody is preparing. Africa is preparing, but the pace is slower. We need to, yeah. we need to, to you know, run. We need to move because technologies are running um, quite fast. So uh, this are this is just in a quick summary. Some of the things we could look forward to and um, how we can prevent these things from, from changing society negatively. Okay. Thank you so much, Gabriel. This has been an insightful conversation. I've also learned a lot from this conversation. Thank you for making our time. Um, if you have any questions regarding AI, completing your PhD, opportunity PhD in Germany, you can reach out to him on LinkedIn. I'm going to leave it down in the, in the description box below. Do not forget to like, share, and subscribe. Um, please make sure the conversations are related to this topic, okay? And um, yeah, I'll see you in my next video where we have conversations about life in Germany and how to also advance yourself and improve yourself professionally or academically. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in my next one. Take care of yourselves. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.